Hello and welcome back to Let's Talk Retro. And it's time for another episode of the Retro Gamer Show. Coming up on this month's show, there's more talk with Andrew Hewson. We have not one, but two people eager to show us their collection. James visits yet another retro game shop. As usual, we have another Games Chart flashback. And we tell you what retro game events are on in What's On. So we're going to kick off this month's show with part two of our series called Andrew Houston Talks. It's Andrew Houston from Houston Consultants talks about some of his favourite Commodore 64 games. And today in this part two, he talks all about Nebulous. Nebulous is a, uh, an interesting uh, game. Um, Nebulous came from John Phillips, and John was an interesting character. He's very quiet um, and uh, one of those intense programmers who just focuses. I always used to enjoy talking to John. So Nebulous, um, he'd sent us a, a, a demo of... Um, he'd been inspired by... Uh, the rainbow effect at the front of Iridium, the loading, uh, the front screen for Iridium has got a rainbow effect uh, behind the word Iridium, where the colours, uh, we call, well, it's just like it, yeah, the colours change. Now, and Andrew Braybrook's having fun there because he's doing something actually illegal on the, uh, on the uh, um, C64. He's mani manipulating the colours within the character blocks and he's doing it by just timing that against the rate at which the electron beams scanning across the screen. So he's having fun. It's a little bit, it's a little bit of technical uh, jiggery pokery. And John Phillips had seen that and he, and he was working on the spectrum at the time. And so he, he interpreted this not as a rainbow effect, but as a sort of cylinder. And so he produced this cylinder or band across the screen and he'd put a sine wave across the top of it, like that. And he was running this sine wave across the top of the, um, of this band across the screen. Uh, and it was very, it was clever technically, and we looked at it and we couldn't see a game in it. And of course I was interested in, you know, where's the game? Uh, and I, we couldn't see a game and he, he was perfectly honest about it. He hadn't really thought of it as being a game, he hadn't thought of it in those terms. So he'd come up to see us and showed us that and nothing very much had come from it. Uh, and so I didn't really think about it very much. And then um, uh, a couple of three months later, he rang me up and he said, look, you know, I've got this going on the C64, do you want to see it? And I thought, right, okay, I'll go, you know, uh, I'll go and see him at his house, at his home. So I went to see him uh, in, um, he lives just, lives just over the border into Cornwall. Uh, and uh, there we are. Now he's on the C64. This cylinder, as it turned out to be, is now vertical, and he was running sprites across the, uh, across the top of it and rotating the cylinder. And the rotation was just fabulous. I mean, we'd not seen anything, anything like that uh, at all. Um, and of course, as soon as you see that, uh, you can see, well, there is a game in this. You can see the platforms. You think there's a platform game here somewhere. And I, I asked John, you know, where he's thinking he's going with this, and he was he talked in terms of battlements, you know, a castle, linking these things up. And I uh, and I said you know, I was very hooked on the idea of uh, less is more at the time that that you don't have to put that much into a game. What you do have to, put, but what you do have to put into it has got to be good. So it's not a case of just chucking loads of things in there. You can actually, if you strip out, uh, strip back, you can get a, you can get a, get a better game by just focusing on what's good. And so um, there was this rotational effect. The sprites were sitting over the top of it. The, the um, you had this pogo figure uh, uh, climbing up and down. I thought of the thing as a tower because that's what it looked like to me. 
and we just in discussions and I said to him what about gravity can you get gravity going on this and he said well not proper gravity not calculating it exactly but yeah but approximately don't mind if it's approximate as long as it's you know roughly gravitational you know just falling down yeah yeah we can do that and so we conceived of this idea of the tower climbing the tower because it's the obvious thing to do with a tower what do you do when you see a tower what well, if you had a bunch of kids at the bottom of a tower what would they do they climb to the top of it wouldn't they uh, and so it's a human thing isn't it well i wonder what's up the top there a view so um so we conceived of the game was climbing this tower uh, and that's what you do in, in nebulous and it's a very it, it's actually a very simple concept and of course what makes it different is that it's it's a platform game wrapped around the tower and we've seen odd versions of that since then but not very many uh, nebulous is pretty unique And of course, Nebulous uh, was given other names else, elsewhere. Why they chose Tower Toppler for the uh, release in the States, I've got absolutely no idea. Nobody asked us. Uh, we licensed the uh, game, I think, to Mindscape, if memory serves. Uh, and they released it, and it came out on the Nintendo. Why Tower Toppler? I mean, uh, maybe, maybe it's the American passion for simplicity. You know, we're going to break down a tower, which I suppose roughly is what you do in, in there, but do you actually climb, climb to the top of it? Why Tower Toppler? I suppose they couldn't call it Tower Climber. But there we are, and Castellian was another name that somebody came up for it in another version. No idea. Why would you do that? Nebulous is a perfectly fine name, it seems to me. So there you go, part two of Andrew Houston Talks, and I really enjoyed that. It's great hearing him talk about some of my favourite Commodore 64 games. Now Andrew has written a book and it is here, it's called Hints and Tips for Video Game Pioneers. Great book, loads of stories in here. If you want to pick one up, we've got a code that will save you some money. So next up it's time for one of my favourite parts of the show. It's time for... So yes, it's time for Show Us Your Collection. And as you probably know by now, we ask you guys out there in YouTube land if you can contribute to this section. And first up today, because we've got two people on today, first up is Retro Zach Vortex. You might know him from Instagram, he also does some stuff on YouTube as well. Great friend of the channel. Check out his collection. Hi, Zach Vortex here. I want to start by saying a big thank you to James and Colin at Let's Talk Retro for asking me to make this short film showing my games room and my video game collection. Remember, if you like what you see, please follow me on Instagram at retro underscore Zach Vortex. Some of my earliest gaming memories are putting 10 Ps into arcade cabinets, so I had to try to build my own to recapture that nostalgia. My first gaming experience was the Sinclair Spectrum, and from there I moved on to the Atari ST. However, my first gaming console was the Sega Master System. The Wonder Boy and Alex Kidd franchises are must-haves on this platform. The Sega Saturn's become a very expensive platform to collect for, but these titles I'm showing you now can still be picked up at a reasonable price, and you should definitely try and get these in your collection. The lack of a proper Sonic title was disappointing, but Nights Into Dreams goes a long way into scratching that itch. One of the all-time great Sega arcade racers has an excellent conversion on the Sega Saturn. My favourite title in my Sega Saturn collection is the Circuit Edition of Daytona USA. This version goes a long way to fixing some of the issues that came out with the launch title. A lot of people dismiss the Mega CD due to the sheer amount of FMV titles that came out on that platform. But this version of Final Fight is by far the best home conversion of this arcade classic. A 
As you can probably see from this Sega wall behind me, my favourite console to collect for is the mighty Sega Mega Drive. Fatal Fury is a really good fun scaled down version of the Neo Geo Classic. Mega Drive has a lot of side scrolling beat em ups and you can't go far wrong with two crude dudes. When it comes to side scrolling beat em ups, they don't come better than Streets of Rage, and in particular, Streets of Rage 2. I've included this arcade classics collection due to the fact it's the cheapest way of getting Gunstar Heroes, which is arguably the best game on the whole 16-bit platform. And finally, my favourite and most played game franchise of all time, Street Fighter 2. Oh wow, what a collection. That was RetroSack Vortex. Clearly he's Mega Drive mad and is a massive fan of the side-scrolling beat-em-up which we love too. Now, RetroSack Vortex is going to be at Play Expo Blackpool end of the month. So if you're going and you see him there, do say hello. Yeah, so like I say, we've uh, said we've got two this month because I really love seeing the collections. Can't beat this part of the show if you ask me. So it's over to Gold Payne who's been good enough to make a video for us right now. Okay, so this is just a quick uh, collection video, uh, just going through some of my collection. Let's have a look. So here's some Final Fantasy stuff, some Final Fantasy for the Game Boy Advance, uh, PSP, nice PSP limited edition and the PlayStation 1 copies also. This is a Final Fantasy 2 uh, Wonder Swan Collector's Edition, this is absolutely awesome, it's in really good condition as well, it's got all the, all the um, plastic and all everything was in it and the game and all that and it's really really nice. Coming over here to Pokemon and some Sigurdin, which is my favourite series of RPGs. Uh, this is probably the most expensive and rarest game in my collection. Well, not rarest, but most expensive anyway. This is a Castlevania Symphony of the Night. I love this game, absolutely fantastic. Had it since I was a small adult child. <laughs> Coming down to the rest of the collection here, kept my PlayStation 4 box and my Yoshi Special Edition box as well. And the my other favourite series is Castlevania, as you can see here. I've got uh, the Game Boy Advance games unboxed, the DS uh, titles and the, some of the PlayStation 2 ones. Uh, down here we have the little Kingdom Hearts section with a little bit of Mario in the middle and some Xbox 360 behind it. Uh, we've got some PlayStation 1 here, PlayStation 3 and some PSP. And down the very bottom there's some Xbox, Wii, uh, DS and some random Wonder Swan and PlayStation 2 games. Uh, so that's my collection. Uh, it's not that big but you know what are you going to do? Um, I don't have the space for a lot of stuff anyway, so hope to see uh, some of your collections, some of your videos uh, up soon as well. Wow, well there you have it, another great collection. Uh, thanks guys for sending in those videos and uh, you know, Gold's collection there looked really good. I noticed they had uh, Ico, the special edition version down the bottom for the PlayStation 2. One of my favourite PlayStation 2 games and uh, that special edition comes with some cards. I've often thought of actually buying that version but not got around to it. Definitely my favourite PlayStation 2 game. Right, so now we come to the part of the show where each month we've been sending James off to a retro gaming shop to film inside so we can all see what they're like. And now last month James popped over to Wales and filmed around a shop there. And uh, so this month I challenged him to go one step further. So where have you been to this month, James? I hopped on a plane and flew all the way to Belfast and the Games Trader.
And that was the Games Trader over in Belfast in Northern Ireland. And if you're over that way, do check them out. Great store, some nice stuff in there, and the staff were really, really pleasant. Yeah, they look like another great shop. So moving on, it's now time for the popular Games Chart flashback. And of course, we're going back to October, but what year will it be? In this month's Games Chart flashback, we're going back to a time when if you went to the cinema, you might be watching... Hey, you. What? Big Daddy. Yeah, that's it. Okay, yeah, that's, that's good. Trick or treat. Or maybe... Right into your eye, Shang. A hey, big boy. Oh my god. Whoa. American Pie. You know, I forgot you've been there and well, there. Uh, I've learned about yeah. it. Make... Or The Runaway Bride. It's not that she's afraid of the wedding. She's afraid of the wedding night. Why, when I was a virgin bride, I took a knitting needle to bed with me. Or The Pretty Awful Blair Witch Project. If you weren't at the cinema and you were listening to some of the latest albums back then, you may be listening to David Bowie's latest offering called Hours. If Bowie's not your thing, you might be listening to Showbiz by Muse. The Pet Shop Boys were all about nightlife. And Tina Turner apparently was at it 24-7. And this was number one in the UK singles chart. Let us take you back to October 1999 and this time it's the Game Boy Colour chart. At number 5, giving it loads of attitude, it's WWF Attitude. Now this game came out on loads of formats, not only the Game Boy Colour but also the N64, the Playstation, the Dreamcast. It's a fairly good wrestling game as you'd expect from a claim. I've played this on loads of formats and the Game Boy Color one uses passwords to save the player's progress. At number 4 it was Wario Land 2. This game was originally released for the Game Boy back in 1998. It was later remade to take advantage of the Game Boy Color hardware. In this platformer, Wario has to recover his treasure from Captain Syrup and her Black Sugar Gang, formerly known as Brown Sugar Pirates. This version of the game was also released on the 3DS Virtual Console in 2012. And up next at number 3, we can't seem to get through a chart without FIFA, this time it's FIFA 2000. Now the aim of the game here is to get the football into the opponent's goal and at the end of the match whoever's got the most goals wins the game. So they think it's all over, well it is now, bring on number two. So yes and at number two it's Legend of Zelda Link's Awakening DX. Like a lot of Game Boy Color games, this game started off on the original Game Boy. And although it was a successful game, many of its complaints about it focused on the control scheme and the monochrome graphics. So this Game Boy Color version was released in 1998 featuring color graphics, compatibility with the Game Boy printer and an exclusive color based dungeon. Together, the two versions of the game have sold more than 6 million units worldwide. And number one, one of the greatest movies that ever came out in the 90s, it's Rugrats the Movie. Now this game was highly praised for the sound and the graphics, but unfortunately the gameplay really let it down. You control the Rugrats as they play through various levels, all based on the movie. This cartridge is compatible with the Super Game Boy, and you can probably find this game at any car boot sale. So that was what was in the chart for the Game Boy Color back in October 1999. And now it's time for... And first up on this month's What's On, if you're down in the south like we are in the city of Bath, 
There's a bar called The Cork and they're having a retro games night every Monday night in October starting at 6pm until late. You can play some classic old favourites like Driver, Mario 64, they're going to have some dance mat action going on there as well. And best of all, you can relive your gaming favourites while getting drunk. The organisers advise that you should go ahead and book a table and to do that visit thecourt.co.uk Next up it's an old favourite of ours, it's the London Gaming Market and this is being held this time on the 21st of October and as usual it's at the Royal National Hotel Russell Square, doors open at 11am and close at 4. If you'd like more information visit www.thelondongamingmarket.com and next up it's an event that we are going to and we are so looking forward to it. If it's anything like the event they pulled off in London, this place is going to be buzzing. And it's of course Play Expo Blackpool on the 27th and the 28th of October. We keep hearing that Play Blackpool and Revival are the must go to events of the year. So as I said we're going to be there, leave us a comment down below if you're going to be there and hopefully we'll see you there and finally this month don't forget it's halloween at the end of the month so if you want to get yourself spooked get yourself down to the one at retro gaming night halloween special this is being held on monday the 29th of october from 8 pm to 11 pm at the victoria 23 lower russell street walsall so don't forget that's probably not a definitive list of retro gaming events that's going on up and down the country this month. There's probably lots of ones we've not heard of. So if you've got a retro gaming event coming up, don't forget to let us know about it so we can promote it here for you. And don't forget Play Expo Blackpool. We'll hopefully see you there. So there you have it. That's about it for this month's show. And uh, we hope you've enjoyed it. And if you have, don't forget to give us a thumbs up. And if you want to contribute to the show and show us your collection, for example, do get in touch. We'd be eager to hear from you. Yes, and uh, we'd also like to say thank you to all our new subscribers and, of course, everyone that continues to support the channel and the show. And everyone who commented last month on the show, their uh, name will be going along the bottom of the screen right now to say thank you. But until next time, James, what they got to do? Keep it retro, everyone, and we'll see you at Play Blackpool. <laughs>